Well, I've noticed that different academic disciplines will have maybe one course that is the make or break it course, whether or not someone will be able to satisfy the degree. Oh, what happened there? Okay, there we go. All right, you weren't supposed to see that yet. Uh, oh my. Okay, let me, for instance, I have a daughter who uh, studied music, vocal performance. And the hard course for someone studying vocal performance is the course on music theory. Because it's one thing to know how to sing, but another thing to know how does it, how does it all work to make it sound that good. So it is the theoretical course on what makes music and sound work and what makes it harmonize. And that's a hard course. I have another daughter who is in the sciences. And the rough course for those in the sciences is uh, organic chemistry. Organic chemistry of a kind or make or break those who uh, wish to go into some kind of profession in the sciences. My, my brother was an architect. And in architecture, the, the, the mean course that would separate you know, those who were going to make it or not was a course called structures. It's one thing to design a pretty building, but unless it can stand <laughs> and function, it's no good. So it's kind of the hard core course. Well, for someone studying divinity, religion, the course for that degree is known as systematic theology. Systematic theology is usually a two semester course you take it the third year, your final year of graduate school, and it essentially is a course that puts together everything that you've been learning, and it, the end result is you produce this massive paper, uh, and you, you, you lay out and you defend what you are about. That's a hard course. In fact, we have something similar to that here for our confirmants. The confirmants, they go through their whole course of study, and then at the end, each of these students, they have to write their credo, what they believe. And not only do they write it at the end, they have to give it to the pastor. <laughs> and we have this day apart with Pastor Alani, and I meet with each confirmant, and we go over what they wrote, and we talk about it, and just, just kind of have a, a, a time of talking about how their faith is developing well, I'll never forget what happened to me when I uh, submitted my final paper for the toughest course in getting a degree in divinity. And I submitted it to Dr. Alan Miller, who's a phenomenal scholar. And when I got the paper back, I got a stupid B. <laughs> and actually, he wrote, B, so far, come see me. All right, well, I, I went into his office. I, I, was, I was angry. I said, come on, a B? And, and he said, Lonnie, what you did, you did really well. You were thorough. But there's something very significant that you omitted. I thought, well, what would that be? He goes, you didn't say anything about evil. And you didn't say anything about sin. You had this great, great prescription, this prescriptive thing for what we, we need, but you never were perceptive enough to talk about this is a diagnosis. And he was right. He was right. And uh, I thought of that encounter in graduate school on June 3rd, 2021. It was the first worship service at Capitol Cinema Theater. And I'm there with a few others at four in the morning just to get things set up to try to convert this 
dark space into some kind of sacred space. And I walk out of the car and, I, and I'm carrying lights and just everything. We had to bring everything in. And as soon as I, we, we rented the whole theater, but the large theater where we were having our worship service, I walk in at the door was this sign. That's why I had that. And immediately I thought, original sin. Oh, no, it, it's, it's going to haunt me again. And, and uh, of all things, uh, there's the, the byline that says, you can't read it there. It says, lead us into temptation. And I go, oh, Lord, so this is what we're going into. It was remarkable. And I, I guess it just can't go away for those of you who use Hulu for your streaming resource, that channel is now highlighting a director's cut version of the movie, <laughs> along with the original version. So, but there it is, kind of the, the preacher's less popular theme, the most difficult to handle. The easiest one to water down, to mismanage, to misinterpret that, I, I call it, it it's, it's a, a human equation. You know, there it is, S-I-N. And to me, when I see S-I-N, I, I process that and I interpret that something inherently negative. Something inherently negative, isn't it? I have a foregone conclusion that there are some things that, that, that's a mess in the world. It is. Some things, they're a, a mess in our homes. There's some things that's a mess in the church. And the mess, if you will, Who's it created by? It's created by people. People who, who, who will cheat or lie, or people who are filled with greed, or they're filled with hate. Uh, those who, who choose to be dishonest or untrustworthy. People who, who may live by some of the lowest standards and who respond to their basest instinct. And all of which is to say, I think it's time as grown up people that we take a look at that. It's so easy to do what I did in my grandiose paper to eliminate it. But we all have sinned. We have. We know that. Uh, in some way or another, all of us have, who have lived to the age of making choices, we've made choices that's been offensive. Sometimes we, we, we have done that knowingly, just to kind of rub something in, sometimes unknowingly. Sometimes our sins have hurt others, and maybe they've been obvious. Sometimes they may have harmed only our soul or harmed the love of God. So I want to focus this morning, though, because it is a great day of grace because we're going to be receiving communion. What does sin do to us? What, what is its grip? And I'd like to illustrate it for you, what I think sin does for you. And have you ever seen one of these? It's a damage can. It's a damage can of soup. I saw plenty of damage cans when I was a young kid who would work at my grandparents' neighborhood grocery store. I love spending the summer. It's a neighborhood store. I love the whole concept of the neighborhood grocery store. Everyone would come in, and, and it was like a family there. And, and every week, trucks would bring in hundreds of boxes of food. And every week, we had to unpack them, and we would have to put the stock up on the shelves. And almost every week, we would open a box, and we would find that some of the cans in the carton, they, they, they were damaged. 
and they had blemish labels or they were crushed. And I remember my, my grandma, here I am as a little, little kid at the old neighborhood grocery store, and on the left, I'm eating up all the profit. That's what my grandpa said. I, mean, I can't make any money, Lonnie, with you here. You're eating everything up, and there I'm sitting on the lap of my grandma. But I remember my grandma told me that this, this was phenomenal. She said, she said, now, don't put those damaged cans on the shelves. Uh, there was a basket at the front with a big sign that just said <laughs> three words, damaged goods cheap. <laughs> Damage goods cheap. Now, some people, I think, feel like that. Damage goods cheap. And I think that is what a perception of sin can do to us. That for whatever reason, either things they've done or things that, that has been done to them, things beyond their control, there's some things that made them feel like damaged goods, bit out of shape and crushed. And I would like to contend that the Christian walk, the healthy Christian walk, starts with a healthy sense of sin. And what kind of position that places us in. A sense of our own sin, because at the most basic level, the good news that Jesus Christ brought is that God is eager to be in a relationship with us. And God has initiated a way of reconciliation. And I'd like for us just to, to take that notion, and I'm going to plot it out biblically. The Bible weighs in very insightfully and helpfully as we look at that whole subject of sin. First, go to Isaiah. Come now, let us settle this matter. I love it. Let's settle this matter of our sin. Says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Isn't that beautiful? That, that's poetic language of, uh, that our sin should not make us embrace being damaged goods. But not only the scriptures talk about the, the wages of sin on the individual, but I think collectively as a nation. And one of the most remarkable passages that deals with, with God's healing for a country is, is found in 2 Chronicles where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and underscore that and I will heal their land. Isn't that beautiful? It's all about healing. A beautiful City, a beautiful city of healing. And, and, you know, okay, so it starts in the Old Testament. Let's just walk through it some more. How do we find that theme continuing? And we, we go to John. We'll, we'll be visiting the place where he actually wrote this on the cruise. He said, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word is not in us. So, we're all in this thing together, gang. We are. And then, we can also jump, not just from an epistle. Let's go to a gospel. Here we have John the Baptist, and why this is so significant, John the Baptist who baptized our Lord, who Jesus, who knew no sin, and recognizing Jesus, what did John the Baptist say? It, it's a remarkable affirmation where at the baptism he says, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, there is that aspect 
of God's initiative that is always seeking to overcome brokenness both between God and ourselves and between ourselves and others and even within ourselves. And so, having said all that stuff about sin, there is good news. There really is. For sin, as we embrace the scriptures, is not an impassable obstacle in our relationship with God. For through Jesus, something significantly happened. God would absorb our sins. He absorbed them. Blow by blow, nail by nail. No matter how much it offended, the overflowing love that God has for us God would not let it become an obstacle to our relationship. God, what would he do? He would rather die than let that happen. Think of the ultimate price that was paid for us. So, I believe the Christian life hinges on understanding that. Thank you, Dr. Miller, in heaven. That Jesus came to show us the nature of God. And the nature of God is forgiving, gracious love. We talked a bit about forgiveness last Sunday, didn't we? power of forgiveness and when we look at it through the lens of our sinfulness and the forgiveness of God it takes on a remarkable meaning for by receiving such love it will enable us to do what to turn around and to give it to others to give it to others it was interesting, the workshops and the main presenters at the Leadership Summit Thursday and Friday. There was an interesting and common theme about what COVID was like and what it did to many of our churches. And in being honest to itself, many people said, Folks, we forgot what it meant to be Christian, how we treated each other. We forgot. And uh, it's a re remarkable conversation about the whole area of reconciliation and being able to capture the one thing that historically grew the church. And it was one thing. It was how they treated each other, which interpreted how they treated others outside the walls of the church, and no one was doing that kind of loving. They were doing everything but that. And people said, there's something different in that place with those people. So, whatever you have done, in your life that you have determined has damaged you, you don't need to carry it with you anymore. Don't carry it with you anymore. You don't need to work it off or beat yourself up for it. Now, you might need to make some things right with others. Sometimes we need to do that with others who you may have harmed, but the only wall that's between you and God is the one that you've built. 
As I read the scriptures, God did not build that wall. He has done everything so that his cross may be the bridge in that gap to connect us with him. So take down that wall. Will you?